Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the brand new East Columbia branch. I hope you're enjoying your time here tonight. My name is Allie Jessing. I'm the Events and Seminars Manager for Howard County Library System. And I'm going to ask two favors of you tonight. One, please note the emergency exits, because it's good to know where they are and not need them, than to need them and not know where they are. Two, please silence your cell phones, if you don't mind. We'd appreciate that. Uh, tonight's conversation, we're joined by Ian Kennedy as our moderator. Ian is the executive director of the Downtown Columbia Arts and Culture Commission, a nonprofit community organization dedicated to enhancing the cultural significance of Meriwether Post Pavilion and fostering the growth of arts and culture in Columbia. Uh, Ian's involvement with Meriwether dates back to 2003 when he co founded the grassroots effort called Save Meriwether to oppose a plan to close and demolish the venue. I can't imagine life without it, so I'm so glad you did that. Thank you. Uh, Bob Dylan, we figured out, has played there maybe nine times, roughly, the last being 2013. And our special guest tonight is Richard Thomas, the George Martin Lane Professor of Classics at Harvard University. Richard was born in London and grew up in New Zealand. He received his Bachelor's of Arts and a Master's of Arts from the University of Auckland and his PhD from the University of Michigan. He has taught at the University of Cincinnati, Cornell University, and currently is at Harvard, where he has written and taught extensively about Bob Dylan and the classics. He also teaches a freshman seminar every four years on Bob Dylan, which focuses on the enduring musical and literary legacy of this Nobel Prize winning icon. In November of 2017, he published the book, Why Dylan Matters, which is why we're here tonight which explores the influence of the classics on Dylan's music, and he's been to roughly 80 Bob Dylan concerts. So he wins the, uh, <laughs> the Dylan concert poll tonight. Following our conversation tonight, we will have copies of this book available for purchase, thanks to Books with a Past, just out in the lobby, and Richard will be available to sign those for you. So thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you enjoy your time here tonight. Great, thank you. Richard? Welcome to Howard County. Welcome to Columbia. Great to be here, Ian, and it's um, great to hear of your efforts for culture in the area. And, um, Thank you. So. As I say to everyone, I, I saved uh, or I did the work because I just like going to shows. So it's right. an excuse for me to continue. <laughs> and so, you get paid to do that. Yeah, now I get paid to do that. Um, bef before we get started with the questions, I just had a couple questions I wanted to ask the audience. So first of all, are there any Bob Dylan fans here? Okay, most of you. Uh, has anyone read the book here? A couple people, great. Well, trust me, by the end of this talk, you will want to read this book. And third, uh, who has seen Bob Dylan in concert? All right, so a handful of you. Well, I, I want to start by saying that this book made me a Bob Dylan fan. Um, I have loved uh, rock and roll music for as long as I can remember. Uh, Bob Dylan was a little hard to approach. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily a joke, but um, but the the thought and the care and the the love of Bob Dylan comes through in these pages, and uh, for me also significantly, this legitimizes rock and roll and Bob Dylan and and the sort of the music of America. Uh, th this and and the Nobel Prize, obviously. Uh, and so it's great to see this kind of scholarship um, dedicated to this art form. So I want to start, Richard, by asking you, how did you get into Bob Dylan? I was 14 years old, I think. Dylan's nine years older than I am, and I sang Blowing in the Wind in New Zealand in 1964 as we were thinking about apartheid and rugby ties with South Africa. So that's the short answer, and I've been with Dylan ever since, um, and, but started thinking of him uh, as a poet, as a genius, a poet who sings, who's a genius, in ways that I think similarly with uh, the Greek and Roman poets, lyric poets, and others who have the ability to express uh, what it means to be a human being in an art form that, um, that matters. And it, it, Dylan matters not because he's been reading the text that I teach in my day job, that is Homer, Ovid, Virgil, he doesn't matter because he's been reading them, but because like them, he can put into, he can put our thoughts into words at a sublime level that we are incapable of doing, but which uh, enrich our lives as we read them in the case of the ancient authors or 
listen uh, in the case of Bob Dylan. So when did you start to place him sort of in that line of these great poets, you know, going back to the ancient times? Sure, though, yeah, in the 1970s, I started thinking of him as I was in graduate school and getting deeper and deeper into the ancient poets. I, I precisely started thinking of him as somebody who had that ability to capture our thoughts. What really, so I started the seminar in 2004, I do it every four years, but it was really hearing Lonesome Day Blues from the album Love and Theft in 2001, in which Dylan has unmistakable lines from, from Virgil's Aeneid, Aeneas in the underworld meeting his father, and his father tells him what the duties of Romans will be to teach uh, peace to the people and to tame the proud. And these famous lines from Virgil suddenly are appearing on the song Lonesome Day Blues of Dylan. It's a complex song, it's about war. The singer seems to be a Vietnam vet, but then suddenly there are these allusions to Huck Finn, so the American Civil War is in there, the ancient Roman Civil Wars are in there, even the Japanese, the Sino-Japanese Wars from the 1930s through the intertext, the allusions, and that's a lot of the fundamental aspect of the book is that Dylan started in 2001 using literary texts uh, in the same ways that my ancient authors do, that is to expect the reader to notice what's being quoted and to import that context into the context of the song. And so really, yeah, 2001 is when it really started and everything, every album Dylan's done since has been some classical text in it. Yeah, and, and, and as you show, it's, it's not just that he sort of, he is a, uh, he is another in a, in a long line of poets like that, but, but he actually has, uh, as you've shown, a, an intense interest going back to childhood to ancient Rome and to the, to the, to the poetry of that time and influenced in part by the movies of that time. So it, it's not just simply that he's, he's a poet of that ilk, but, but that particular uh, time is, is of great interest to him. Yeah, I mean, he's pre-Sputnik, so before the U.S. Congress uh, cut Latin out of the subjects that should be taught, because Latin wouldn't help us compete with Russia, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, so, And he was in the Latin club, biggest language club at Hibbing High on the North Canadian border. His uncle owned a movie theater and a lot of the a lot of the McCarthy uh, Hollywood movies about Rome, ancient Rome, you couldn't write about McCarthy, we couldn't do movies, but a lot of the producers, directors, actors were using Rome as a metaphor. And, and Dylan, I think, was seeing those movies, took Latin, uh, was in the Latin club. Uh, 1963, his first trip out of the country, we had been in, doing a BBC show in London. He went to Rome, the only side trip. Came back to Gertie's Folk City in February 63 and sings a song, the chorus of which is, I'm going back to Rome, that's where I was born. By which I think he means spiritually the Roman stuff, the ancient stuff that he saw touched as a boy was, he's, he's said I was born in the wrong, wrong place, you know, born in Hibbing, Minnesota as a genius. So I think he associated, well, Hibbing's a great place, by the way, I've visited, but, but he associated with Rome, you know, when I paint my masterpiece, the streets of Rome are filled with rubble, ancient footsteps everywhere. And I think Dylan, on those trips to Rome, ancient footsteps, he saw those footsteps and eventually started quoting the poets who made those footsteps 2,000 years before. So, so do, do you think that your early love of Bob Dylan influenced your career path, or do you think, do you think it was sort of uh, maybe the other way around, that your appreciation for Dylan uh, came as a result of your intense study of these? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great question and, a, and an interesting to me question. So I, I've been working since... Uh, 1980s, 1990s, on this phenomenon of intertextuality, which Dylan really only starts doing with literary texts in 2001. Now, he's doing it with the folk tradition from the very beginning. So there'll be a line of a folk song, and Dylan, as he said, you know, I'll take it and see where it goes from there. So he's, he's been in a form of this, but, um, but it's, it's, yeah, I think my... I think the coming together of Dylan as a subject of 
scholarly study along with the other poets I work on was is a 21st um, century phenomenon really. Yeah. So I, I want to pick up on, on the concept of intertextuality, which is something that you spend a lot of time in the book discussing, and which I think is um, something that, that a lot of us know or, or, or would know based on the, the famous T.S. Eliot quote that you reference in the book, which is, young artists borrow, mature artists steal. And, <clears throat> and Dylan was a master uh, thief. <laughs> and and uh, as you show, it's, it is, he has taken texts and taken ideas and, and lines, whole cloth, from texts as old as Homer and, and then as, as current as, you know, his contemporaries. And, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about that, I think, uh, because it is, to me, that was one of the most compelling parts of this book is just how much clearly he has in his mind and is able to take these texts and repurpose them in a way that really enhances their, the meaning of his songs, but also the, the source material. Yeah, I mean, well, and, and hip hop does it too, it's sampling. So it's, it's, you know, it's really there in literature going way back. And I mean way back, right back to the very beginnings. But uh, yeah, so Eliot, immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. And then what he meant by that, he goes on, it's a 1920 essay, he goes on to, to say, so the mature poets take something and they make it their own, they make it better or at least different from what they took, whereas, uh, whereas the immature poet is imitating and you can see the imitation and the, the thing imitated is better than the thing that is, th than the new product. So successful theft is what Dylan has been doing throughout because Dylan is a genius. His artistry allows him to, to steal. And just one anecdote, Virgil, the main, as I say, the main poet I work on was accused in antiquity of plagiarizing Homer. And the tone of his response to that, as reported in A Life of, Home of, uh, of Virgil from 120 um, AD, is very much like the tone of a response that Dylan made in an interview. So Virgil is said to have said, if my critics think it's so easy, let them try. They'll find out it's harder to steal a uh, the club from Hercules, club of Hercules, than to steal a line from Homer, by which I think he meant in that Eliot sense, steal it and make it better than, or at least different from. Now, Dylan is asked in an interview, a wonderful interview in Rolling Stone called Dylan Unleashed, uh, and he really is unleashed in this, and, and he's asked about sort of borrowing, and he said, and this poet, this Confederate poet, Henry Timrod, whom he, whom he reuses in 2006, and he says, uh, he more or less says the same thing. If they think they can... Uh, do it and it can make their songs, um, <clears throat> let them try it, you know, um, they'll soon see how far they can get. He then goes on and says, I'll see the motherfuckers in hell uh, <laughs> and other choice things. But you, but his tone is exactly the tone of Virgil's and so it's a tone of incomprehension of those who don't see what his art is doing and what his art has been doing, particularly in recent years. Yeah, and, and uh, you referenced it at the beginning of your answer. It's not just the, the lyrics. He has, off, uh, has taken melodies and rhythms and songs, in particular from sort of the, 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 folk, the American folk tradition and the blues. Um, but even more directly, uh, you talk about the song uh, The Tempest, which y you reference as a sort of culmination of all of his great songwriting talents. And The Tempest, for those of you who don't know, is a song from a uh, 2012 album yep. of the same name about the Titanic. And it is a 14-minute song uh, that is, uh, you know, along the lines of a sort of Homerian epic, Epic, right? right. It's just huge. Um, the, the lyrics are just very uh, expressive and, and very detailed. But he also, he stole the melody. Right, he it. stole the melody from the Carter family, a song on the Titanic. The, he stole the... Um, the refrain, the watchman, you know, the, we see it through the sinking through the watchman's eyes. There are, I think, four or five stanzas in the, in the, in that version from the 19, you know, soon after the Titanic. There's a lot of Titanic songs, you know, folk songs about how the rich people maybe deserved <laughs> what they get. Titanic go round the 
curve run into the big iceberg fairly Titanic fairly well. It's sort of a blues song. But Dylan Dylan unashamedly takes that, but then he he has this narrative. There are bits of the Roman poet Juvenal in there. There's um Leo, so we think it's DiCaprio because of the movie, right? Leo said to Cleo, uh, this, uh, Leo comes in earlier, and Leo must have heard and thought, oh, Bob's doing a shout-out for me. But eight verses later, uh, there's a, Leo said to Cleo, I think I'm going mad, but he'd lost his mind already, whatever mind he had. Uh, <laughs> so imagine being DiCaprio and hearing that second second thing. But it's, um, and it's, a, it's a, just a... Wonderful, but the pathos of it. So the the it's very elaborately organised. But then we see through the eyes of the captain, the captain barely breathing, um, and then the captain looking down. And there's this descending guitar um, melody as basically the ship's going down. Um, um, and he read the book of Revelations and he filled his cup with tears. So this biblical language that's always been there for Dylan along with everything else. He's the incongruity of the strands when you separate them out is is marvelous. A lot of it is humor, pure humor, but it the art the whole of the art that he produces is uh is incomparable. And another thing I love about that song highlights a sort of a, another theme that you see a lot in in uh in Dylan, which is the idea that the, the sort of blending of truth and untruth, and you have a you have a quote uh, from him in the book that says, um, "What is it? Uh, if if you told the truth, that was all well and good, and if you told the untruth, that was still well and good." And that's what he learned from folk music, and that that is true of that song w with its incorporation of Leonardo DiCaprio, who we know was definitely not on the Titanic. Uh, <laughs> But it's also true more broadly for Bob Dylan, right? In sort of crafting his image uh, and his persona, uh, it's hard to know who the real Bob Dylan is. Right, and I quote at the beginning of that chapter, which is partly on Chronicles Volume 1, if people haven't read the so-called memoir of Dylan, it's it's fantastic writing. It's it's like nothing else Dylan has done. It's a, just a wonderful book. but. I have a view that chapters one that it's a play, basically. Chapters one, three and five are more or less true. Chapters two and 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 uh four are just full of whoppers, but he's created this story and it's in that chapter two that he talks about folk music and and talks about it not mattering whether one sings truth or untruth. And that he's going back to the oldest wisdom poet of the Greeks, Hesiod, who meets the muses and the muses say, we know how to sing many things that are true, but also things that are false but look like truths. And that's that's poetry. The Greek verb for poetry, poieo, means to make or construct. It doesn't mean to report. So so the poet is, uh, uh, and Dylan is exactly in that. And I quote at the beginning of that chapter, um, Mark Twain, the beginning of Huck Finn. So this is a, I can't remember the wording, but this is a book by uh, Mr. Mark Twain who mostly told the truth. Uh, uh, and so I think Dylan, who's wearing his Huck Finn cap in the early years and on the Mississippi is, is as important for Dylan as for, for Twain. I think, I think Dylan is getting that from Twain. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's art. It doesn't whether or not it's true is irrelevant. It's whether it works as a song or a Well, it, as he says later in the book that you mentioned, uh, it doesn't mat really matter where a song comes from. It matters where it takes you. Right. And, and that, to me, sums up that approach to truth and untruth. Yep. And he's all, he also says in the Nobel lecture, who's seen the Nobel lecture on YouTube? With Oh, you've got to see it. It's 28 point something minutes long. This light jazz accompaniment. So even when Dylan's doing a lecture music has to be involved and it's just a wonderful it's along with the music cares speech he gave a couple of years ago the clearest and i think most honest statement of what where dylan's art is coming from and that nobel lecture ends with the odyssey um in which he he says odysseus did this odysseus did that but then he said and you too did this you too and the you too is bob dylan but it's also all of us and Bo and Odysseus, the ancient trickster, and Bob Dylan, the 
the modern trickster sort of come together. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about a song. Uh, Richard and I had a wonderful conversation beforehand. Um, and uh, we, we talked about one song in particular um, that, that you re reference in the book uh, called Fourth Time Around, um, which is a song that uh, Bob Dylan wrote apparently in response to Norwegian Wood by the Beatles, which the Beatles wrote, uh, was their attempt to sound like Bob Dylan, basically. And he wrote this song, and he ends it with this line that is uh, directed at John Lennon. And the line is, I never asked for your crutch, now don't ask for mine. And it is a, it is a brutal line, because when you listen to those songs back to back, and I am a huge Beatles fan, Norwegian Wood is nothing <laughs> compared to the, the song Fourth Time Around. And, and it speaks to this sort of competitiveness that Bob Dylan had and this, um, you know, ego maybe isn't the right word, but confidence in his ability, but also a recognition, I think, that John Lennon was maybe his, his only peer of that time, the only one who sort of approached that, that, that sort of equal status. And, and it's interesting to me for, for a few reasons. Be, one, because of just n knowing that they had a relationship and then hearing the sort of communication in song, but also about the idea that, that this is, to, to get to what you said about intertextuality, this is, this is how artists sometimes communicate with each other, is through their own work, and, and sometimes they do it in ways that aren't necessarily friendly. Uh, Right, yeah, and it, it's, it's, I mean, father killing is always involved, I think, with, with art and with intertextuality. And that, that particular song, others have seen, seen the connection, but Norwegian Wood, isn't it good? Um, and then in the fourth time round, her Jamaican rum, and then she did come. So Dylan, I think, is almost making fun of the rhyme, the simple rhyme scheme of Norwegian Wood, and he makes it even, he doubles up on the rhyme scheme. So we're, we're, Norwegian Wood will have two lines rhyming. Dylan will have four, and but it it's it looks like a song to a woman. I mean the the mystery, the mysteriousness of Dylan's song is also interesting. So when you get to the that final line, if you're thinking of Len, and it's absolutely crushing. So I never asked for your crutch. Now don't ask for mine. But you know they, um, as Eliot said in another context, no, that is not what I meant. That is not what I meant at all. So a Dylan song can always have that denial. But but yeah, so Dylan is said to have sung it to Lennon. Uh, I shudder to imagine what the reaction was, and you can you can get a sense of that from the um, the uh, Don't Look Back um, <coughs> the movie. Um, Panabaker's movie of the 60 in 65 where Dylan meets Donovan and Dylan's been shown Donovan who's a few years younger than Dylan uh, and he's seen this picture on the wall and they say oh that's Donovan he's Scottish Bob Dylan and Dylan says I hate him already and then there's a scene <laughs> where Donovan comes in and sings um, uh, to sing for you that's what I'd like to do I forget the title of the song but and then Dylan picks up his guitar, and even before Donovan's song has ended, he comes in with, it's all over now, baby blue. Um, and you just see and the, the, the unforgiving camera, camera of Pennebaker on Dylan's 19-year-old you know, face as, as Dylan is singing this absolute, for its moment, I mean, the, these lyrics are really beginning and precisely at that time with, with Dylan's song of the... 64, 65, 66, and, um, and yeah, and so Dylan wanted to show Don Donovan and I think John Lennon, who was, who was the boss. It's now, Leonard Cohen, whom I also love, um, Leonard and Bob had an exchange, you may have seen in the New Yorker, this wonderful article on Cohen, but in, which, in which Bob said, yeah, you're number one, Leonard, but I'm number zero. Uh, and uh, and I think Dylan knows that. I think it's true, and I think he doesn't shy away from it. He's had years of people sort of dismissing him. Um, I myself, in the 80s, sort of took a rest from some, never from the backlist, but then coming back to the 80s stuff, particularly in performance, and performance is, is what chiefly matters to Dylan. A lot of material that thought you thought on the studio album, hmm, that's sort of, 
so so it, it becomes fantastic yeah and you talk a lot about the live shows in uh in your book and and the importance of uh set lists and the songs that he chooses to play and where he plays them and and sort of how he plays them and it um you know, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because it, it's almost as important to the songs themselves. Well, and certainly as a musician, these songs were not meant to be read on the page. They were meant to be heard, and, and even more so, they were meant to be heard live, right? Right, and the, the Dylan set list, I mean, a lot of concerts, um, both the set list and the arrangement will be, will be static throughout the tour of you know, some of the great groups. But with Dylan over the years, you know, there would be pools on what will the set be on the set list tonight because it could be any one of 200 plus songs. I mean, that he, you know, the, if you look at the number of songs he'd been singing continuously. So, so um, the set list, um, the set list in recent years have have settled down. And I have a he done in an interview talks about triads, how triads are important. He's been talking partly about this wonderful. Uh, three vo three uh, album uh, set triplicate um, of the American standards that he's now weaved a lot of these into the set list of his concerts. And I noticed um, looking at the concerts and really from going to a concert in 2016 down in Clearwater, Florida, um, right after he got the Nobel, that there, that there were triadic structures to the set list so that the first part only songs from the 60s, Don't Think Twice, uh, and before Blonde on Blonde, so through 65, through Highway 61. Um, uh, and But also some of these new standards, you know, not Sinatra, he's not, he's not covering Sinatra, he's uncovering this music from the 1930s and 40s that rock and roll came to kill, as Dylan himself has put it. So then in the center, nothing from the... Uh, Nothing from the 80s, nothing from the um, uh, 70s other than Tangled Up in Blue. Some concerts it would be a Simple Twist of Fate. But so he's got the 70s there. And then the end are these songs, particularly uh, Early Roman Kings, Pay and Bloods, so from the 2012 album Tempest. But then with a lot of um, uh, Autumn Leaves, Melancholy Mood, Stay With Me, these songs from the 40s that absolutely suit the voice that he uses, and I, I mean that, he uses a particular voice in singing, he always has, but also the songs that he's been writing for a singer of his age to be singing in performance. And so, and he, he has for two, three, almost four years maybe doing this, this set, set list, begins with Things Have Changed, the song that one of the... Uh, the Oscar for Wonder Boys, and um, and I have a few pages in Rome uh, in July, you know, November 2014, 2000, yeah, 2013, I guess. Um, it's two nights, and he sang 12 songs, you know, um, including um, like a Rolling Stone that he didn't sing again. So he departed from that very set set list in Rome, and sang. Um, just this, just some of the most famous songs from the 60s in any period. And I, my view is that he, that was an homage to Rome, um, and I'll be seeing him in Rome in April, so he can, he can by changing a set list, he can prove my book wrong, <laughs> or at least he can prove that he's read it and is changing the set list back. But, um, but yep, again, that gets us back to Rome and to his artistry that the, that the set list, it's not, you know, it all matters what what comes when. You know. So where did the idea for the seminar that you teach come from? Did, it, was that, uh, I, I mean, is that something that, that someone approached you about, or was that yeah, something was, you came up with on your own? Okay. Well, I was chair of my department, and so it was asked to offer more, get my colleagues to offer more freshman seminars, so I thought, well, why don't I do one instead of asking a junior faculty to do one? And... Um, I did one on poetic translation, but then really after hearing 2001's Lonesome Day Blues, but really in my mind over the years I'd been thinking, well, it might be interesting to teach Dylan in a certain way. And so, so it was partly after hearing Virgil on 
love and theft in 2001. So I put in for it in 2003 and started in 2004, every four years. And I, the reason, part of the reason this exists is that I was teaching it on the day that the Nobel, the Nobel Committee announced the Nobel Prize on o October 13th, 2016. If I'd been a year off, this wouldn't exist and I wouldn't be sitting here because <laughs> the New York Times was in the classroom that afternoon and it was in the, in the Times that Saturday and so here we are. Yep. Wow. How did, uh, how did that make you feel when you heard the news? How does it feel? <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it felt it, it felt like it felt right first of all. I thought it was right. I we can talk at some point about whether song is poetry. Song is poetry you, def depending on how you uh, Dylan is not readable. Dylan has to be sung. Um but it yeah, it's I was confident that my view, the view I I'd, I'd reached of Bob Dylan and and that many others I admire, writers I admire um and friends you know, were right about Bob Dylan, but that this committee had reached that view was was pleasing and was vindication and 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 you know there were not a lot of colleagues, but there were some at Harvard. There is there is the annoying person out there who says, "Oh, how's Mr. Zimmerman doing these days?" <laughs> and uh, at this point, I don't even roll my eyes. But uh, <laughs> but so there were a few of those that I that I particularly mentioned the Nobel to in case they hadn't heard about it. But, uh. And so what is the response that you get from, from students? It, it's, um, I know it's a popular seminar, freshman seminar at Harvard. And do they come in as Bob Dylan fans or, or do they just come in because this, I mean, this is, yeah. this is a pretty cool subject matter, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a freshman seminar, about 100, and so people apply. I usually get about 40 applicants and I have 12 students. So I usually try and pick to get a mix. So there'll be three students who know Dylan as well as I do. I mean, who who have discovered Dylan and um, and know the whole, he's an 18 year old, so who basically see what Dylan is uh, in the same way that those of us who are not 18 see what Dylan is. Then there'll be, you know, three or four who know know him a bit. It's interesting that Hurricane is the most, I asked him to name a song or an album and talk about why. And Hurricane is by far the winner of that, whether because of the movie or, or not. But these days they're too young to really know the that movie. Um, and then and then there are five or six who, um, there are some who want to, who are songwriters, some who are trying to understand how to be a better songwriter. And there are a few who are trying to find out why their parents have uh, <laughs> been playing this stuff all their lives in long car trips and... And who maybe take trips to see him in concerts. Right, exactly, <laughs> yeah. So, and then there are a couple who just thought, well, it's, it seemed like a, a lark, so I thought I'd try. But I can say not because of me, but because of Dylan, that by the end, the appreciation of what Dylan is, is sort of, has been universal. I mean, um, I haven't, students can drop courses up to seven weeks into the course, and nobody's done that, and uh, it seems to... Yep, seems to have worked. So, I, I mean, there is a whole field of Dylanology mm -hmm. out there, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. there are scholars and there are conferences, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I, I'm curious how your book has been received among uh, among that set, um, you know, in particular to folks on, what is it, Expecting Rain? Is that the, the Expecting Rain is the, the website. website, yeah, which has sort of everything... Dylan related and and sort of near Dylan related every day. You can go on there and, and look, and it's it's tough not to get obsessive and go and see if if there's another review on there and so on. But um, but that uh, that also has links to some other great sites. Yeah, I've had um, I've had a couple of I won't name names, but uh, um, a couple of Dylanologists whose work I've known have contacted me and and really, really like it and think it's a contribution. I think I'm the only classicist who's, who's done a, a book or a, I've done a couple of articles over the years on Dylan and the classics. Part of you know, their bits of them are in here. Um, but yeah, I think uh, there are some, I mean, there's no reason why they should contact me, but, um, but the ones that have have been, have uh, thought it was good. 
So uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll ask the audience a couple questions. Uh, so I want to ask you, do you think the, the Nobel, was it, um, was it deserved? Yeah, it was. I mean, Dylan, if Dylan has become a classic, he's going to be around, um, uh, you know, who, who, who's read Pearl Buck lately? Okay, one. Okay, but so I think Dylan will be around. And Pearl Buck, I haven't read her, but I'm sure she's great. Um, I didn't read her because I grew up in New Zealand. But, um, but I think Dylan, if you think about it, will be around. Now, the Dylan Medal has on it, that, sorry, the Nobel Medal from 1902 that Dylan studied apparently with much interest has on it a young man sitting under a tree singing with a writing tablet on his knee standing in front of him as a muse holding a seven-stringed lyre called the kithara, which is where the word guitar comes from. And that's on the medal of the Nobel Prize for Literature. And that no Nobel winner looks more like that image than Bob Dylan does. So, um, um, And yeah, I mean, you can say ancient poetry was sung, we've lost some music. But, but Dylan, we have to redefine what uh, literature is because of Bob Dylan. Um, so I would, that's the way I would put it rather than, and I think that's what Dylan said, meant in a Nobel lecture when he said, I don't do literature, I can't be read, you have to sing what I do. He didn't then give back the Nobel Prize, um, but I think he's, I think his, his move there was one which challenged us to rethink what song is and the relationship of song at that sublime level, you know, not Mary Had a Little Lamb, um, though Dylan did do Old MacDonald uh, version some years ago. But, but yeah, I do think he deserves it. So this is, this is maybe an impossible question to answer, but I have to an ask it. Uh, what's your favorite Bob Dylan song? I can't really say, but I can do it in the moment, so I make myself think of one um, uh, long and wasted years. Of uh, Tempest, uh, yes. which yep. the, the last two verses, um, so much for tears, so much for those long and wasted years. So it's a song of remorse about a relationship that hasn't worked, isn't working. But I could say, I could, I could keep going with the favorite songs that occur to me every five seconds, but I think our time is up. So. Yeah, we <laughs> well, with that, I, I do want to open the floor to some questions. Um, so if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Uh, we don't have, to have microphones or anything. Um, yes? I'm curious. I think you said that you'll be seeing Bob Dylan in the spring in Rome, and I was wondering what is the context of that? So this was a question real quick about um, Mr. Thomas is going to see uh, Bob Dylan, uh, two concerts in Rome, uh, well, one, one in Rome, uh, another in Italy, yeah. um, and what is the context for that? So, yeah, so I, um, I'm i going there because he's doing concerts, <laughs> <laughs> and and I have some friends, Italian classicists, who want me to give lectures while I'm there on Dylan and the classics, so I'll give two lectures at two of the universities in Rome, one in Naples and one in Milan, and um, I will go to... Uh, one Dylan concert in Rome. Then what I'm really excited about is a Dylan concert in Mantua, which is where Virgil was born. Um, and so having Dylan, listening to a Dylan concert in the town that Virgil, whom he's been quoting, was born in 70 BC will be a lot of fun. So, and it's, since, I'm a, since it's a subject of my scholarship, it's, um, it, it's supported by my research funds. <laughs> Smart man. Smart. <laughs> uh, I'll take another question if we have one. Thanks. Have you ever communicated with Dylan or to or wanted to or whatever? Yeah, those are great. I mean, different questions and all great. So I, when I first taught the seminar, I wrote to um, Jeff Rosen, who's Dylan's manager, who's been a wonder wonderfully helpful with Dylanologists, you know, to the point that he can. But Dylan is a very private man, uh, I did say, so if Mr. Dylan would like to come to the freshman seminar, I'm sure the <laughs> students <laughs> would be delighted to um, to meet him, and uh, I got a very tactful response, uh, the effect of which uh, that wouldn't happen, but um, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, and to me, sure, I'd, I'd 
love to, but uh, to me it's the art. I mean, as, do I need to meet Virgil or T.S. Eliot? Um, it would be fine, but what matters is the art that they produced. And, and Dylan wouldn't probably say very much. I mean, that's, you know, he, he gives us what he gives us through his art, um, not through banalities. The interviews are, I have a, a chapter sort of in his own words, which is partly chronicles, but also partly the marvelous um, interviews that he's done over the years. Some you can get the essential interviews by Jonathan Cott, which is a good collection. Um, but so he's very careful about what what he says and what you know what questions he answers, what questions he even is creating. Well, there's a there's a line in the song Netty Moore, um, which goes, um, and Netty Moore is a slave woman. It's an old song from the 1850s. She's shipped off, I think, to Louisiana, and the singers in South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, and singing a song about Netty Moore, who's gone and now meet again in heaven. But again, Dylan incongruity is in the middle of this song, which reworks that traditional song, the title's the same, but um, um, the world of research has gone berserk. Too much paperwork. <laughs> uh, and I take it that, that that could be Dylan and the professoriate has always been, a, you know, there's always been an edge there, self-ordained professors tongue and so on, but, um, but yeah. I mean, I think I. I mean, I doubt that he reads much. Maybe not even any of it. He has read. He's mentioned over the years. Griel Marcus's book, wonderful book on the Americana of of um, Dylan. But my guess is he he doesn't have time. You know, he's probably helped by people around him to read. You know, what they might recommend. If you're watching, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Is there another question? Yes, in the back there. You, you alluded to the parallel between Dylan as a performer and the ancient tradition of singing and the royal tradition. Could you expand on that a bit, please? Yeah, so I, I did have a chapter in the book, but it was, it was thought to be a bit too scholarly and dry, maybe, but I'll probably do it up as an article. So there were, in the ancient world, from way back, so we have the Homeric texts, which are preserved as texts because they say something about Greece. We have lyric, mo mostly in fragments. We have tragedy uh, because it's important for the city of Athens and for edu and then texts are preserved because they're important for education. But we have a class of singers who were uh, were called um, uh, kitharodes, which means singers. It means guitar singer. Ode is a song. Kithara is guitar. So we have this class of singers, and we mostly know them. We don't have maybe more than a couple of fragments of their song, but we have them mostly preserved. There's a wonderful one in the Metropolitan Museum in New, in New York, and they are elaborately dressed, very ornate dress. Their instruments are ornately designed, so think of a Stratocaster. They're, um, um, and they traveled from town to town around the Mediterranean, and whole towns would empty out, we know from these written sources that talk about them, towns would empty out to hear their songs. So so basically singing to the guitar happened in ancient Greece. The song didn't get preserved because it was popular. The song that did get preserved are, are the Homeric texts which are sung at Athenian festivals and so on. And if you think about folk song, you know, without the Lomaxes, what we would have lost, without child's ballads in the 19th century, what we would have lost from that. So it's what, what gets written down is what gets defined as classical or high register or worth listening to, but I'd love to have those ancient Kithara songs. If they, if they emptied out of town, they must have been damn good, right? <laughs> Question over here. Current singers? Yeah. yeah, I think hip hop, um, and I don't know enough about hip hop, but um, 
but I think that's definitely a, a tradition that is doing it. That's called sort of sampling. Um, I don't think anyone's doing it quite like Dylan, the person that you might have thought might would have been Leonard Cohen, RIP, but, um, but Cohen's song, I think, came from a different place, as, as Dylan's did too. Dylan's in the mid-60s, you know, the Mr. Tambourine Man, there are bits of French symbolist poetry in that, the drunken boat by Arthur Rimbaud and so on, but, but Dylan, in that 60-minute interview he did with Ed Bradley, you know, said, when Bradley said, "Can you still do that?" He said, "No, I don't know. I don't know where that came from, but I can do other things now. Um, but I don't know. But I'm also not. Um, I'm not a follower of um, of a lot of modern um, song songwriters. I like what I hear, but it's pretty much accidental. You know, when I was growing up, everybody knew what album of what singer was coming out. Now, of course, it's so with all of it." indie stuff i mean it's it's and it's great but it's but it means you there's not a community around song and the same songs that is and something's been lost in that i think but uh. do we have another question oh one over here yep Yeah, Dil yeah. How did Dylan come by his classical education? Was he self-taught? Yeah, Dylan what, did this Latin club. I doubt that they they probably did some Latin grammar, and they did. We know from a document I found that they that Dylan on a particular day. It's one of the few records we have of what Robert Zimmerman was doing in his sophomore year. Um, but I think, as I say, that he was interested in Rome through through the movies, through the Latin club. They seem to have done things with Greek and Roman gods who turn up a, in his song. But but I think he, he went to the University of, of um, Minnesota for maybe four semesters, didn't go to any classes. Um, but he's always read eclectically. And the, the texts that he's, so he's read, and he's it's undeniable. You'll see it when you pick up your copy of the book. Um, that the Homer, he uses, um, uh, Fagel's Penguin Homer, so, um, and it's unmistakable, it's three or four lines from here, three or four lines from there, always of Odysseus's voice. Uh, he uses Peter Green, a wonderful translator, uh, tra Penguin translation again of the exile poems of, um, of Ovid, so that's a specific translation text. And he uses, um, uh, for Virgil, Mandelbaum's 1970 translation, so, you know, translations can be very different. So it's there are some people who have denied that as Ovid is in Virgil's um, album, uh, Modern Times, 2006, get it, Modern Times, Ovid from 15 <laughs> AD, and also the Charlie Chaplin um, film, Modern Times. But, but uh, so there are some critics who have denied that, and then they quote the Ovid, but they're quoting it from a translation that he didn't use and 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 for the cadences so there's a song in green's uh, in green's translation a, a poem to ovid in exiled by augustus where he says no one could ever claim that i took up arms against you i didn't rebel against you why am i being exiled and dylan saw this line he puts it along with seven or eight other songs from different poems of ovid in the same song which is addressed to a woman, seems to be, the relationship's over. And he has, a song, he has the line, no one could ever say that I took up arms against you. And it's a, it's a line of regret about, you know, why, what did I do wrong? No one could ever, so it's become a metaphor. The arms have become a metaphor. Um, so Dylan's, Dylan's, part of Dylan's poetic ability has come around to seeing another literary text, not just, classical ones, Chaucer, he seems to be, the Canterbury Tales seem to be in there, um, and all sorts of other texts too, but it's in, it's interesting that he's taking these, he's, you, can, you can finger these specific translations, which are great translations, so he hasn't done it by accident, um, that, he's, um, that he's taken on and, uh, and sort of creatively reusing. Do we have any other questions? Yes? Um, I'm wondering, if so many artists have covered Bob Dylan's songs. Um, how did 
the meaning shift to you, or does it, or do you have a favorite cover song um, when somebody else interprets his work? Yeah, well, I guess All Along the Watchtower by, by Hendrix would be the main one because it's a, it, the arrangement is one that made Dylan change. Dylan adopted <laughs> the Hendrix um, arrangement. He saw that that was right for it, particularly for as a closer in concert, which it was, I don't know how many thousands of times, but uh, or hundreds of times. So that, um, you know, the, there of course are the, you know, I heard Blowing in the Wind first on the Peter, Paul and Mary version, which was the pop version. I heard, as many of you did too, um, Mr. Tambourine Man on the Birds version, Roger McGuinn. You know, some people say, and Dylan, Dylan, Dylan himself, at least wrote that that was a better version than his own. I I think there is a there's a blog out there. I think it's a blog called No No One Sings Dylan Like Dylan, and that's sort of where I am. Um, I think one that comes close is Richie Haven's Just Like a Woman, um, which is on um, was at the 30th anniversary uh, in 1992 uh, in Madison Square Garden, where Dylan. Um, Dylan was just beginning his comeback, but where all of these fantastic artists um, turn up, sort of, you know, George Harrison, um, Clapton, uh, Neil Young, Tom Petty, and so on. And uh, and Richie Haven sing, sings that. He also sings it in, um, in Todd Haynes' wonderful movie, I'm Not There. If you haven't seen I'm Not There, it, it I think, explains, if you like movies, uh, there are six characters, I think it's six characters who are sort of basically different personas of Dylan. It's a one, have you seen it? It's a, it's a fantastic uh, movie. Yeah, I think Haynes really, really sort of gets what Dylan, what Dylan is or the many things, some of the many things that Dylan is. Um, but other covers, there was a recent thing on Expecting Rain about the top 12 covers of Dylan, but I did, since I'm not, that interested. What I find more interesting is the way Dylan covers Dylan in the way that Dylan, through change of intonation, through change of musical arrangements, um, basically creates a completely different song through change of lyrics. If you see her say hello, um, you know, so he did the version in New York. Um, uh, they weren't happy with it, so we went out to Minnesota. The the version on Blood on the Tracks is the one that we have from Minnesota, um, bootlegs volume one through three in in ninety one, ninety two, ninety one. Um, <coughs> basically, we get the New York version, the one that was prior to the Blood on the Tracks one. We got it, you know, sort of fifteen or more years after that. But then he went on tour, and there are some, and the relate. So if you see her say if uh, you. S Kiss her once for me, but if you see, it, or if you're making love to her, kiss her for the kids. So that change is a world of change, and it gets a lot worse. Uh, <laughs> if <laughs> in um, in this show he did in Florida in in '76 during Rolling Thunder, but um, so yeah, for me, Dylan. Part of the appeal of Dylan, you know, what he doesn't do is what most artists in performance do is, and they're great artists whom I love, and you know. You know Neil Young, Springsteen, Cohen. When he was doing it, they'll give you basically the version that you know was the studio version with some differences, maybe. But Dylan, Dylan can create new meaning just by simply, you know, emphasizing a different word or, or you know, sort of having a descending sort of guitar or whatever. You know, I get a sense that that people when they go to concerts, they want just just play the hits. And just play them like they sound like on the album, so that I can sing along. Uh, do you think there's something about Dylan fans that appreciate that they're seeing? You know, m he's playing the hits. You know, he plays "Tangled Up in Blue" almost every show. It, you know, he's he's playing like a Rolling Stone, but they're reinterpreted. Do you think there's something about Dylan fans who who are open to those reinterpretations of these songs that you know? Yeah, I think absolutely, but I think the fans who aren't coming, so he's not fill, filling football stadiums now, but I don't think he cares. I think he's, he cares about his art, and um, and so, you know, there are a lot of people who can't figure out, even who know Dylan well, you can't figure out what the song is until you're in the third 
verse and you catch an actual word. Uh, Dylan is better. Dylan's been much more clearer in the last two, three, four years with his enunciation and, and I find him you know, much easier to hear. You know, being sung along to is not something Dylan has ever really liked and so I think a lot of the arrangement has been to frustrate to frustrate that, to stop people <laughs> singing along with him because he's an artist, it's his art. He doesn't want to hear some drunken stone guy sort of... Um, how does it feel? Does it feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question. I saw a hand over here. What, what if anything, would you say was his biggest fail? Like, what was something he tried that just it's fell flat? What was his biggest failure? Um, it's probably... Not personal, I mean artistic, but like just trying something that just didn't work. Yeah. Well, some people might find you something from the 80s. Um, but uh, I, I can't really say. Tarantula um, might be up there for some. I've tried to read Tarantula. Um, bits of it are okay, but it... it now, did he, did he put Tarantula out because uh, A.J. Weberman, the so-called Dylan garbologist, was putting it out, um, and so they had to get a version out? Would he have preferred to... You know, he, he, he wrote it in a difficult period. Um, you know, 60, in the 60s there where things were happening very fast, uh, drugs presumably of various sorts. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't, for me that's not a great success. It's not something that I get a lot of pleasure from reading or a lot of, um, you know, sort of comprehension. But, uh, uh, I mean, one, you know, what what is this shit was a review of, self-portrait in 1970 um, and Greil Marcus who said that has since has since said you know that yeah I mean it, but if you but another self-portrait which came out fairly recently where where a lot of the studio work was redone and a lot of the overdubbing was taking out I mean those it's a fantastic album it's not one I it's not one I spent any time with when I I think I bought it when I was 19 um but uh but I listen to it, plenty of it now so so that's why Dylan is you know said he's often two or three years ahead of his fans and you know for the poet and the painter far behind his rightful time behind his rightful time does that mean ahead of his time it's um but I think that I think that great art which isn't simply continuing what it receives and doing a version of it, but that is constantly in a quest to push forward and find new connections and new manifestations is is always going to come across as having failed periods. And um, but time will tell. Well, I think um, as you show and and as uh, fans of Bob Dylan know, over the course of more than fifty years, far more successes. Uh, far more hits than misses in his career. So with that, uh, our time here is done. Thank you so much, Richard. This was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for <laughs> listening. And thank you. For sure. So there are copies of the book available. Um, Richard's going to stick around, and he'll sign some copies. And uh, before we go, I have to say happy birthday to my wonderful wife, wife Lena, who uh, let me... Um, do this with you guys tonight. So thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of the night. So where are you going to be signing it? I think down the hall.